So do find a seat and make yourself comfortable. Please do feel free to come and join us further towards the front. And we'll get underway in just a moment. Please find yourself a seat. We're just about to get underway. to get our first day underway. So if we could just please have some silence. We're ready to get started. It's my privilege as ALF's Chief Executive to well, be the first to welcome you here to Edinburgh and to this year's ALF Annual Conference. And in a moment when I introduce this year's co-chairs, we want to give them a really warm welcome. So we're going to get started um, by practicing straight away and waking up. So if you could just put your hands together and give a very warm welcome to everyone in the room. That was pretty good, but I think we have a big hall to fill today. So hopefully in a moment when we welcome all three co-chairs, we can do even better. My name is Maureen Deepwell. And together with the Board of Trustees of ALD and my staff team, welcome to this year's annual conference 2019. It was a long time ago that I first stood on the stage at a site visit on a very rainy day, and I was imagining what this room would be like filled with our community, with our delegates, for three days. Now, more than 18 months later, that day is here and it's become a reality and I am so thrilled that we are able to bring the conference here this year and that all together we'll be able to hopefully have one, two or three very interesting, thought-provoking days. I want to welcome a number of people as I introduce the co-chairs um, and also give a shout out to all the volunteers that have been involved in making this conference happen. Many of you, I think more than half of you, are speaking at our conference this year and it's a real proud moment to see so many participants engage, share and bring their knowledge to this event. I sometimes get a little bit frustrated with sitting in wood panelled rooms talking about the future of education that must surely arrive at some point now. But I feel in this particular venue that we can learn from history and build on what's come before in order to shape the future. I was a little bit disheartened in the last week that things have looked quite so bleak and I'm hoping for 
me at least, but also for every one of you, that the next three days will be a very positive and warm experience, and that all of you can play a role in making this a welcoming and inclusive conference like our community is all year round. And now it is my privilege to introduce three people to you who have worked tirelessly for over a year, chaired every committee, approved every slide deck, set agendas, picked keynote speakers, helped us make this venue work for us, and who have been working behind the scenes trying to really build the vision at the heart of this year's conference. Now, I'm sure many of you put a lot of hours in as a volunteer in one way or another, and that you know exactly what it feels like when you work behind the scenes for a whole year to make something happen. Sometimes for a lot longer, but in this case, for over a year. And so, I think you can all put yourselves in the shoes of the three people I'm going to be introducing now. I've been waiting for this moment, walking up to this stage, and hoping that the conference that they are co-chairing will be enjoyable and rewarding for you as it has been for them to volunteer. So we have had a practice run, but now I hope that you can give the loudest, warmest old sea welcome to our three co-chairs, Melissa Highton, Louise Jones, and Keith Smythe. Aaron, thank you very much. Um, it's so lovely to see you all here. Um, Louise and Keith and I um, have been working. Marin gives us a lot of credit, but <clears throat> I think you all know that most of the cred goes to the old team for organizing the conference, but also the many volunteers, the committees who put together the social program and the program of workshops and presentations that you're going to see. Um, it's my privilege to welcome you back to Edinburgh University. So to welcome you to univer um, Edinburgh University or back um, to Edinburgh University. We last hosted the conference at Edinburgh University in 2001. I'm very pleased that we're able to do that again. Um, the university has a long history, but we also have a long association with ALT. Um, and we have a long-standing relationship, a long-standing commitment uh, to what this conference is about, um, and I'm very pleased that you're able to be here. So as well as providing a venue um, a couple times and, and this time, we've also provided some top quality speakers over the years. So our principal, Sir Tim O'Shea, was a keynote in 2006. Jeff Haywood was a keynote in 2014. Sean Bain was a keynote in 2017. And this year, there's more than 20 University of Edinburgh's um, colleagues presenting at the conference. I'm very pleased. We also have a long-standing commitment to CMALT. Um, some of us have had our CMALTs for an incredibly long time, it feels, but others are shiny new and getting their awards at the conference this year. I'm very pleased that we have so many CMALT um, holders at University of Edinburgh. Uh, it's an important part of what we do in the university to ensure the professionalization of learning technology um, and the prof professionalization of the staff who work across the university in all the schools. And it's that discipline of reflecting on the evaluation and the context and the policy environment in which we work that ensures that they are able to work as part of a community of shared knowledge within the institution. And I think that that gives University of Edinburgh a business advantage. So I see that investing, the institutions investing in learning technologists and the professionalization of learning technology um, as, a, as a profession, as a discipline, one with history, uh, one with a growing community of scholarship is very much part of what the university is committed to. I'm also very happy to welcome you to McEwen Hall. Um, it's a fabulous venue. The name McEwen, um, yes, it is the beer company. Um, William McEwen paid for this building in 1897 with the profits from much pale ale export and 80 shillings. 
And you may be able to tell that it's recently renovated. We had 19 miles of scaffolding in here so that the conservators could get to the, could clean and restore all the paintings. So it gives us a, a beautiful venue. The central piece of art up above you is known as the Temple of Fame. And it has in it the names and pictures of muses, philosophers, and some of Edinburgh's alumni. I'm going to ask you to look up just now for a moment and see if you can see the inscription. The inscription says, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her and she shall bring thee to honor. That's Proverbs 4, 7. And you might see this proverb in other places. It's around the dome of the Manchester Central Library and the Library of Congress. And it tells us something about knowledge and education and how they have their place, but that it's wisdom that makes people successful. So knowledge is the accumulation of information. Understanding is the grasping, comprehension, and interpretation of information. But it's the wisdom and the application of information that one understands. So wisdom is learning how to take the knowledge given and apply it to our lives in a workable manner so that it benefits us and it benefits the lives of others. So perhaps the message of the venue for the conference is get and share wisdom and get and share beer. So I've asked you to look up and I'm also gonna ask you to look down. As you leave the building, and you head across to the other sessions in Appleton Tower. As you go out of the front door of McEwen Hall, look down, and you'll see one of our newly commissioned pieces of public art. It's a work by Susan Collis, and it's entitled, The Next Big Thing is a Series of Little Things. And it's a meandering series of little shiny dots that sometimes go unnoticed. And that reminds us that although it's tempting to think about the big ideas, and it's exciting to imagine a technology or a magic pill or a silver bullet, finding that one thing that we're doing wrong and that can correct, be corrected by a single change or a new technology and improve the world we work in, don't ignore the small things. There's a st the steady drip of work that wears down the things that were set in stone and changes the shape of what we do that's often where the success starts. And I think for a lot of us working in our institutions, although we try to imagine what the big new technology might be that will change things, a lot of what we do every day is actually a series of quite small things, just working with the people in our institutions um, to just make little steps and change what we're doing. So University of Edinburgh, we continue our contribution to the um, the conference this year. I'm delighted to see so many colleagues from Edinburgh attending the conference, either colleagues who work here, some students who study here, and any of you who might be alumni and have graduated from here, or might think that you might become students or staff in Edinburgh. Please do enjoy the venue. Um, there's a, a big group of Edinburgh staff presenting and, and delivering sessions. Please do meet them and talk with them about their work. We'll be talking about our partnership with Wikimedia, the work we've done in lecture recording, improving our VLEs, extending our online learning, improving accessibility, the work we're doing with learning analytics and digital skills, computational notebooks, and our very good friends from Edina, our sponsors of the Learning Technology Awards um, on Wednesday night. So to just welcome you again, to University of Edinburgh. Um, I'm very pleased to be chairing with Louise and Keith. Um, I've asked you to look up and look down, and I think Louise is going to ask you to you. look from side to side. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. As you know, my name is Louise Jones, and I'm delighted to be one of the co-chairs here with you all. I'd particularly like to say a big welcome to you all. We have 471 delegates over the three days, and even more are going to be joining us online. 
and the fact that we've got such a record number of people joining us this year is testament to the fact that you present the role that you do. The role of the learning technologist has an increased awareness now across all of the education sectors and that's something that I think that you realise is becoming a very valued and a very credible role as well. And that's also part of the work that ALT have done as a very credible organisation championing the role of being a learning technologist. So we have a lot to say thank you to them for. So to get you warmed up, and I'm quite well known for my little warm-ups, I just wanted to ask you all, has anybody here played ping pong? Yes? You can put your hand up. Okay. But have any of you played verbal ping pong before? I don't think so. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to stand up. Yeah, stand up. And I would like you to partner up with somebody. And when you do, I would like you to firstly shake their hand and introduce yourself. So, hello. How are you? Okay, you and a three, my... Oh, hi! <laughs> okay, so you are now going to have a game of verbal ping pong. We've looked up, we've looked down, and now it's time to look side to side. <laughs> so Marin and I are going to give you a little demonstration of how this is going to work. So I'm going to serve first, and when I say ping pong, and then when I say pong, ping. So now it's over to you for 10 seconds. The person on the right is going to serve first and they can say either ping and pong. And then we're going to switch over. So away you go. <laughs> That's fantastic. And now I would like you to switch over so the other person can serve. Fantastic. You're all doing so well. <laughs> so I'm just going to spice things up a little bit and we're going to do this in a series of three so i'm just going to demonstrate ping 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 pong 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 ping pong ping 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 pong pong ping pong <laughs> okay and again the person who served first in a series of three away you go And now you can switch over and have another go with the other person serving. <laughs> okay. I... <laughs> okay. Now, the smiles and the laughs on your faces are incredible. And yes, this is a bit of fun, but there's also a little bit of meaning behind it. So when I looked around, I could see some of you thinking really hard about replying. Some of you were taking a risk and batting it back straight away and firing it back over. Some of you were like, what is this all about? So the reason I mention this is because actually it's really relevant to remember that this is three days of time for you, time for you to learn something new, try something new, take a risk, open your mind to something. And I want you to hold on to that as you enjoy the three days. So it's my absolute pleasure to pass you on now to my other co-chair, Keith, who's going to give you some information about the scholarship award. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed. Um, I discovered I'm not very good at ping pong. Um, uh, my name is Keith Smythe from the University of the Highlands and Islands, and like Louise and Melissa, I'm absolutely thrilled to be co-chairing this year's conference. Um, from an inclusive and convivial activity, I'd like to say something very brief about ALT and the ALT conference as an inclusive and collegiate and supportive one. This is evident in the way in which we've tried to provide a range of virtual participation opportunities for colleagues that aren't able to be with us. And we look forward to engaging with colleagues who will be joining us online over the next few days. Um, but it's also evident in the work that we do through the Doug Gowan Fellowship um, uh, uh, Scheme. The Doug Gowan Memorial Scheme was established in memory of Doug Gowan, uh, former president and chair of ALT. And it provides support um, to enable learning technologists who may not otherwise be able to come to the conference uh, to attend the ALT annual conference. This year, we had um, a record number of applicants um, for Doug Gowan Fellowships, and we're absolutely thrilled um, to be able to have awarded 12 fellowships um, that have brought um, 12 learning technologists from various backgrounds, working in various contexts, to this year's conference. So to our 12 Doug Gowan Fellows for 2019, um, welcome, welcome to your conference, and we'll just give um, our colleagues a round of applause. <laughs> We also extend a warm welcome to our exhibitors and our sponsors. Um, exhibitors and sponsors are absolutely crucial to enabling the ALT conference to run. Um, we would encourage you to explore the exhibitors and the technologies they're demoing, uh, the services they're offering, uh, have discussions about what they're trying to do to address particular challenges in the digital education space. Each of the mornings uh, of the conference, we will welcome um, one or more of our exhibitors. Um, all of our exhibitors are member organisations of ALT and are playing a valuable role in contributing to the work of the association. Uh, and our first exhibitor that we welcome today uh, is VVOX, and we have Joe from VVOX who's going to join us. Um, so we give a, a, a warm round of uh, applause to Joe and welcome. We'll leave you in Joe's hands for the next couple of minutes to explain a particular tool we'll be using across the conference over the next few days. Thank you, Joe. Cool. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, my name's, um, my name's Joe. I'm pro uh, the Customer Success uh, Manager for Education at VVOX. Uh, VVOX is a, uh, a student response system primarily used for Q&A and polling in lectures, in workshops, seminars, etc. Um, today we're going to be using it in a, um, in, a, in, its, in a kind of conference environment. So it's going to be used for, uh, for Q&A and some live polling throughout the plenary sessions um, here today. Um, firstly, I just wanted to thank um, Alt for having us back for the second year. It's um, a real privilege to be here. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it last year, so this is my first one. And yeah, I'm really excited about um, yeah about being here today. Um, in order to take part, in order to ask questions, um, all you need to do is to join the VVOX session on your um, on your phone, on a laptop. Um, and to get connected, all you need to do is open up a, um, a web browser and go to vvox.app, and then you'll be asked to enter a meeting ID to join the session. The meeting ID for the session that's happening um, throughout is uh, 1032373913391. And there's actually instructions with the sort of the meeting ID uh, sort of dotted around. So there's one over there, one over there, and there's also one. Um, down here, so if you forget it during the day, it'll be there. We've also put out on all of the uh, all of the chairs um, a, a card that's got instructions for joining the session. So again, um, please feel free to sort of take those with you or leave them on the chairs for um, for the next people to come in. Um, so yeah, hopefully everyone's uh, starting to be able to get connected now. Again, all you need to do is to go to vvox.app within a web browser, and then enter the meeting ID. On the back of the cards that you'll see on the, um, on the chairs, we've also got a little bit of a, um, a fun uh, alt-themed crossword, which is welcome for people to uh, complete. Once you've completed those, feel free to come down and um, visit us on our stand and return them to us. I've been told there are prizes for um, yeah, returning completed crosswords. So. Um, yeah, please, uh, please go about doing that. 
once you're uh, once you're into the session, you'll see a screen that looks a bit like um, a bit like this. You can join the Q and A by hitting the uh, the speech bubble icon that's down the bottom, and that will take you to um, a screen where you'll be able to enter comments, ask questions. Throughout the session, the chair people will have um, an iPad with them, so they'll be able to see all of the questions coming in and be able to address them accordingly. Um, we've also put in there a feedback survey. It would be you know, really appreciated by, um, by the event organizers if you can um, complete that during the course of the next three days. Um, yeah, that feedback is um, yeah, really invaluable to them. We're not going to we're not going to run um, a quick poll because we're running a little bit behind um, schedule. So let me just finish off by saying, yeah, really pleased to um, yeah, really pleased to be back here for a um, yeah for another year, and I hope everyone really enjoys the conference. Cheers. So now it's nearly time for our keynote. So it just um, saves me to do a few last housekeeping announcements. Um, if you haven't already voted, the Learning Technologist of the Year Award, Community Choice Award, is open for votes until midday tomorrow. So please do vote. You have a printed program in the guide you have received when you registered, but hopefully you will use the online platform to plan your day and make the most of the sessions. All of the sessions are either here in the hall or in Appleton Tower, which is a short walk. If you're not sure where to go, there is a map on the back of your printed program. And when you open the back page, there is a layout map of Appleton Tower. And there will also be staff and helpers on hand to show you the way. As far as we know, and this is something that I'm not sure we've experienced before, there's no changes to today's program, <laughs> at least none that we know of. Um, there are volunteer session chairs in all the sessions, so if any issues occur, please do ask them in the first instance. And do please come to the conference help desk where you registered this morning if there's anything we can do to help. When we're hosting nearly 500 people over three and a half days, there's always something that's bound to go wrong, so we're here to help and manage any issues that arise as well as we can. An important announcement is that no fire drills are scheduled here in McEwen Hall throughout the entire conference. If there is a fire alarm, it is not a drill. And please take a moment now to look around the hall and look behind you to make yourselves familiar with the nearest exit. Fire stewards will be on hand to direct you to evacuate the building. There is, however, excitingly, a fire drill planned for tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock in the other building. More of that tomorrow morning. There's no other housekeeping announcements, um, so I will now hand back to Melissa Hyten to, in a moment, introduce our keynote speaker this morning. So please put your hands together one more time to welcome Melissa back to the stage. Thank you again. Sue, are you ready? Okay. So um, we're going to get the conference off to a great start. Um, Sue is our first keynote speaker. Uh, Sue Beckingham is Principal Lecturer in Information Systems in the Department of Computing at Sheffield Hallam University. She's a Senior Fellow of HEA. She's a Fellow of CEDA. She has her CMALT qualification certification. Um, you may know about her um, and her life because she shared a lot about, uh, about herself and her personal learning journey um, on, uh, through social media. Um, she, has a, she talks a lot about her personal learning journey as a lifelong learner. She has a TEDx talk that I highly recommend. Um, great for this venue. She's spoken a lot about wisdom, and we have wisdom up around the ceiling. Um, wisdom, understanding, learning. Um, and I expect she's going to take us on a journey around that uh, here today. She's an internationally acclaimed expert on digital networking. She specializes in levering, leveraging the power of social networks to develop the personal learning networks and employability of students. Uh, she's, so is the co-founder of the highly praised Learning and Teaching in Higher Education Weekly Twitter chat, LTHE chat. 
um, which many of you may participate in, I'm sure you're familiar with, um, and attracts participants um, from all around the world. Uh, in 2015, she was selected uh, by JISC as one of the top 50 influencers in social media in higher education. She's an advocate of both informal and formal learning, and today she's going to speak to us about revisiting the affordances and implications of interconnectedness and socially mediated publicness. So please, she's going to speak for about 45 minutes and we'll take questions after that, but please give her your full attention. And as she's speaking, think about how what she's saying applies to your own lives and the places in which you work. Thank you very much. All right, well, this is exciting. So, this is an overview of what I propose um, to talk about. As an advocate of social media, I can and do wax lyrical about the potential of digital spaces. However, as I started to research what I was going to talk about for this conference, I wanted to look at the data, the dialogue, and the actual doing. And learning analytics is something that's becoming very popular with the universities. Some are further ahead than others. But the whole data thing really got me even more curious as I started to research my talk. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey. Some of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to skate over quite fast. The resources to look at and revisit later. Um, there's a lot of guidance in, in there. So don't think I'm trying to rush past it, but I just wanted to put them in. And I will share the presentation through SlideShare, and of course it will be shared um, through Alt and, and, and recorded as well. References um, will be found in the footnotes of the presentation, so I've not put references actually in all of the slides. Uh, any images that aren't cited are from Pixabay, and uh, they're free for use, just so people know. So in 1999, Douglas Adams um, gave us some suggestions about how to stop worrying and learn to love the internet. He said that anything that gets invented after your 30 is against the natural order of things. I think we'll all argue that we'll uh, disagree with that, although Snapchat still um, is something I struggle with, uh, despite all the help from, from Suzanne. Sheila, the chair of Alt, recently blogged and said, I think when our world is in such a state of flux, it's important to ensure that ethics and developing criticality are at the heart of education. We need to be questioning the validity and basis of everything just now. And I took that advice on, on, on board. So I'm going to start with some future predictions taken from the past. So in 1975, Seacard said, a full analysis of all its implications, privacy and computers, the skills of the psychologist, the anthropologist, the sociologist, the lawyer, the political scientist, and ultimately the philosopher will be needed. And I think that's very true, and it's true still to this day. The computer is widely feared. It constitutes a threat to the middle class employment. When we're talking about technology, there's a fear, the internet of things about is that going to replace jobs? They're all concerns that still continue. If you've read 1984, the telescreen in the room was something that was actually going to be listening. Fast forward, the smart TV, listening into everything you say. A couple of years ago, there was a lot of concern about what it was actually doing. And even in their terms and conditions, Samsung was saying, please be aware. And yet we're moving towards now in America, St. Louis uh, University are giving students echo dots as FAQs, um, as, as a, a means to gathering information that they can just ask those, those questions. How secure is all of this? I think we're still trying to find out. In no sense of place, in 1986, Morowitz imagined this situation where if all the walls were brought down, 
and we were all in one open space, what would that look like? What would we hear? And he gives this scenario. It would be somewhere where we could hear what teachers were saying, what people were saying to the children, politicians having one drink too many. If we fast forward, we have Facebook. I'll say no more on that for the minute. Howard Rheingold in 1993 predicted what might happen when you went into the supermarket and the data that might be collected over the course of time and then put on an optical disc and sold as a marketing tool. How many people have loyalty cards? That's exactly what it, it does. Whether they sell it or not, well, we know that there are issues there. And then Gross in 1999 was predicting the millions of embedded electronic measuring devices that would probe and monitor what we're doing. We fast forward, smart technology, the internet of things is happening now. There are all sorts of devices that are monitoring what we're doing and people are buying these, putting them in the houses. We fast forward, there's a smart fridge I don't know whether anybody's got one now. John Lewis is selling them at £2,749. But they provide access to the internet. You may have read it in the paper um, a, a month ago. Dorothy, her account, Twitter account, has now been um, uh, closed down. But she was a young girl, if you didn't hear the story, where um, she was actually had a, a mobile device confiscated because she wasn't concentrating when she was cooking a meal and actually set something on fire. So she then tried to um, contact her friends through a Wii and various other devices uh, and they were confiscated and uh, our last resort was the, um, the, the fridge. I think it's quite a, a bit of initiative really from <laughs> something my daughters would do. And there's concerns about the consequences of computers and internet continue. So, so bear with me because I'm going to just take you through a bit of a journey of, of some of those, those concerns. Because although the concerns about social media are, are apt and, and really relevant um, to today's age, we've had concerns for a long time and some of those concerns are still, still with us. And there's things that we need to be able to understand and have conversations with our students, our colleagues, our family, to help them really get to the point where they, they know what's, what's dangerous and what, what isn't. So the dark web versus the, the deep web. The dark web's the bit that uh, we really need to concern ourselves about. The deep web is, is where things are hidden, but they're hidden for the right reasons. And you know, if we're thinking about online banking, medical records, we would hope that they would be safe and not be exposed to um, the public. And obviously the surface web is where we're using the World Wide Web our, ourselves. And there are social consequences of, of the internet use, and there's the dystopian view and the utopian view. So on the one hand, people have talked about Cats and Rice wrote, you know, the internet has bleak consequences, but it also has overwhelming potential. And there is both. There is no one or, or the other. And on privacy, um, Weber talks about those that argue in favor of post-privacy. So if privacy was abandoned and we shared everything, you know, this utopian view, then wouldn't that be better? And yet, on the other side, the defenders of privacy have, quite rightly, fears about what that might mean. Talking about totalitarianism. Totalitarian, I can't say that word, <laughs> and dictatorship. If anybody's read about Bentham's Panopticon prison, this goes back to the 1700s. It was a prison where it was circular, not similar to this, this room, where the guard would be in the middle. The prisoners couldn't see the guard, so they never knew whether they were being watched or not watched. And people have taken this concept um, and looked at how information systems could be using that um, to take our data unknowingly to our, ourselves. I'm just skating through a few 
quotes over the years, and these date back to the 80s and the 90s, there's this fear of data valence, disinformation, the super panopticon, electronic panopticon, panopticon sort, are all talking about the control and, and the worry about surveillance. And in today's age, if we think about it, you know, these could be the things that are actually covertly tracking keystrokes of staff. What are they looking at on the internet? It's all possible. Parents, as you know, can monitor what the children are, are doing. And even public transport cards, they're monitoring the movements and tracking what we're doing and where we're going. But one way to challenge this Man and colleagues looked at an inverse panopticon of sous-valence, as they called it. So they flipped that over from the French words below and, and to watch. So how could these technologies help us? So it may be that we become the surveyors of the surveyors, surveying the surveyors. So you know that could be customers photographing shopkeepers. Um, police officers, there's plenty in the news where that's actually happened, people taking videos where police have enforced um, and been brutal to, to people that they've um, got in their, their, their hands. And how could this be used in our classrooms by students? Something to consider. Students can record what, what we're doing, hopefully we're not doing anything in the classroom that we wouldn't be proud of. It's something to think about. So this idea of equivalence, sous-villains or counter-villains, I'm sure Theresa will tell me that's not how you pronounce it, if you're listening. <laughs> We're supposed to bring power to the people. So um, Weber talks about Google Glasses. I don't know whether anybody managed to ever get a pair, but they've kind of been and gone and done, done their day. Um, but people were worried, people were suspicious. You know, if you walked around with Google Glasses, you know, are you filming me? I, I would certainly be um, suspicious. And then if we think about the filter bubble, if you've not read this book, it's definitely worth looking at. And this is where invisible algorithmics edit the web. We know and experience, all those of us that use Facebook, that we don't actually see everything that's posted. And we certainly don't see it in the order that it's been posted, but the internet's exactly the same. If you sit down with a friend and Google something, you might be quite surprised. You'll not get exactly the same results. You served what the computer, Google thinks you ought to know based on previous searches. And there's filter bubbles and echo chambers that can both increase exposure to diverse perspectives, but they can also um, create ideological segregation. And this research that Flaxman done has actually found um, that there's both. It can actually bring us that the things that we see on the internet, whether that's through social media or through the internet, can, can do both. And if you're not scared yet, then you need to buy this book. It's coming out on the 17th of September, The Permanent Record by Edward Snowden. So going on to um, data, a day in data. It's quite frightening and staggering the amount of data that we've got. 500 million tweets, 294 billion emails. Oh my goodness. If anybody could ban anything, I think it would be the email or at least revisit what that should look like. And there's various other um, infographics that portray how much is shared in the Internet Minute. You may have seen these before. Um, but it's increasing. When you look at it like for like over the years, it's increasing. The number of websites are, are increasing. A million new Internet users come online every day. That's 11 people per second. If we look at Facebook, Facebook captures around 600 terabytes of data from its users. That's absolutely huge. What information is that actually capturing? So to some extent, we're drowning in data. And I'm sure if you look at these 
um, examples, you know, the reports that we're, we've got to read, the notifications, the information that we have in meetings, pre-meetings, post-meetings, etc. It's a concern. How many people have two screens at work? I'm actually quite jealous of these two screens because <laughs> they're bigger than mine. But the, the um, objective of showing you this is that not only do you have your screens, you've probably got your mobile phone, you might have other devices. Um, so this information overload is, is quite concerning. But it's not a new concept. And if we go back to the um, 1685, this, this was quoted, um, people were of fear of books. It will make the following centuries fall into a state as barbarous as that of the centuries that followed the fail of the Roman Empire. And as a chasm, this is a good article between technology and corporate cultural that really makes me think about the technology reality, what is possible and, and what's actually done. So I'll just take you through, through these. We've got unlimited accessibility of everyone to everyone by many communication channels. Everyone is expected by managers to be available 24-7. Sending messages is easy to do, and it's free. And we sanction the unlimited sending of these messages. People still send emails when there's no need to send emails. <clears throat> It's affecting our attention, there's no doubt about it. There's queued messages. My email box, after going back off holiday, is quite frightening. I don't know how I'm gonna get through those emails and do a full-time job, and I'm sure you're, you're the same. And yet we're supposed to keep up with those and respond promptly. And working from home technology, which, you know, I, I get an awful lot done working at home, but there's still no clear understanding about the policy of where to place that work-life barrier. And that's something I think we've had to try and develop ourselves. And, and it can work in, to your favour, you know, if you've got children or dogs, you want to take those out for a walk first thing and you want to work later in the evening, then that's your, your prerogative. But that being able to turn off and on from your technology uh, and it's, it's something that we're still grappling with, I believe. And this multitasking that we're expected um, to do more increasingly. Not everybody is good at multitasking, and neither are our students, although they would give us um, <laughs> the belief that they are. Technology can be distracting. And that was written by um, Strother. So each year, um, the Ipsos Global Survey, CIGI, Ipsos Global Survey is, is done, and, and they've actually surveyed 25,000 um, users. And I just want to take you through some of the um, responses from that. Social media companies were second only to cyber criminals when it comes to fueling online distrust. More than half of those concerned about their online privacy say they're more concerned than they were a year ago. I certainly am. I'm rethinking really about what I'm doing. A majority admit to falling for fake news. I think we're getting a little bit more savvy, but not all of us. And it's an education. It's something we need to keep talking about. You know, if it's too good to be true, then it probably is. Be careful of those links that you're, you're clicking on, the information um, that you're giving, being given. And this distrust in the internet is causing people to change the way that they behave online. Less than half of the global citizens express at least some degree of confidence that any of the algorithms are unbiased. 32%. 68% obviously are the, the opposite. And then there's, I guess, a bit of a contradiction to what people are saying. Some are saying that they, they feel that the lack of transparency is... is um, exploitive, and yet by contracts, uh, a lack of human emotion expressed confidence because it wasn't subjective. So, you know, we're at a, um, a point where we can't really agree. 
So we need to remind ourselves that when we're using social media, it is based on a model providing a free service in exchange for advertising. And it always has been. And I think as technology advances and gets more sophisticated and you get more personalized and potentially relevant adverts, this could be useful. But it's a double-edged sword. My husband certainly won't be pleased if it's telling me more things that I can shop, especially if it's shoes and handbags. <laughs> so, hope on the horizon. Recent headlines, we've had compromises of email with Facebook and, and Google and breaches um, with the hotel chain Marriott and new changes um, to our data protection, uh, introducing GDPR. <clears throat> so, there's lots of work going into looking at um, personal data protection, and these are reports you can look at later if you want to go into um, more, more detail. And Buttarelli, in a keynote, talked about part of the responsibility is enabling the individual to challenge what you do with the information. And I think this is something that's really important, something we need to fight for um, individually and, and collectively. The right to be forgotten was a case in 2014 that actually, I guess, kick-started a little bit to, to get um, GDPR in so that he could take his information off the internet, and that's something uh, we can now ask for. And then there's cookies. I think it's really important that we understand what cookies mean. Uh, how many people get really annoyed when you go on a website and you see this sign up and it says accept and you just click accept and you carry on reading your article? Hands up if people have done that. Quite a lot, quite a lot. Do you ever read the cookie settings? Some people will and some people haven't. And it's enlightening. There are different types of cookies. There are the ones that are functional and really important to um, keep the website flowing, but they're the ones where we sell the data, that people can sell the data. They collect the data and they'll sell them on. But remember, the cookie settings are an opt-in now. You have the choice to accept or reject. So when we're concerned about the data and people selling that and using um, websites or social media, you have that choice to opt out of it. And cookies come in different flavors. So as I mentioned, there's the functional ones. This is a bit of a traffic light, so strictly necessary. The green ones, the functional ones, may be set up by third party providers. Do we know who they are? What does that mean? And then there's the targeting cookies. So they're actually gathering this information and that will follow you around the internet. And certainly if you shop online, you'll find the things that you're looking at follow you around with little adverts and the privacy policy. And these people are really quite clear about you know, what, what they're, they're doing. If you read the small print, which obviously a lot of us don't, it says on the Wired website, if you don't agree to the terms consent contained in this privacy policy, you must immediately exit the service. So it's a choice. And Wired's policy, privacy policy is conducted by Condonast, who have one billion consumers in 32 markets through print, digital, video, and social platforms. So just visiting one website, you know, what you're looking at could be shared a long way. There are also optional free apps via Facebook. A recent one was the one that could make you age. Who created this? Where's that data going? They're dangerous. I would really suggest that people don't use these things if you don't know where your data is going, unless you're happy for that data to go there. And ironically, when I went in to actually read the article, of course, I came up for the cookies, supporting great journalism, because um, this is where the advert was from. So the Information Commissioner's Office can tell you about cookies, small text files, the good things that you can do. Um, that they're useful, the relevant things, but it's the extra, and you need to make that choice whether that website, that social media site is, is doing that. 
The Internet Size C is um, asking global leaders to prioritise digital security. So there's work going on. The Online Trust Audit and Honour Roll does a, an annual survey, which is quite interesting, in America, and it looks at um, top websites. Um, say top, it'll look at you know the most most popular. It'll look at banking, it's commercial, um, and shopping, and all sorts of diff different different uh, health websites. And it looks at consumer protection, site security, and privacy. And what's interesting is whilst websites are getting better, people are getting more um, vigilance and, and caring, if that's, that's the right expression. One bit in the summary, because it's a very big report, there's a nice infographic that brings out some, some of the data. Over 42% of these um, sites use web tra trackers uh, to share information with third parties. So, you know, even the websites you think you could believe and trust, so health, health websites, banking websites, in terms of trust, might be a, a <clears throat> something to consider. Cambridge Analytica, I'm sure you've heard about. Um, this is where a Facebook app called This Is Your Digital Life, information for people that were actually using that um, was, was shared. Allegedly, people were notified if their details were involved. But again, if you've got a busy Facebook site, do people see that? Did they understand what that, that actually meant? So the Information Commission's Office, which is also connected to, to G, GDPR, um, reminds us that you share data constantly online. Um, but there is data protection law that they're developing, and I don't think we're absolutely there yet, or they're absolutely there. Um, but the idea is that it will help us. And it provides information about how you can um, do that um, safely. There are lots of social media fact sheets that could be useful to use with your students, with family, with friends. Uh, they're all available on the um, ICO website. Um, and there's a whole host of guidance on, on your rights. I'm not going to go into those details, but it's there to, to revisit afterwards. <clears throat> And the concern is that you know, we want to strengthen the rights of people to take back control of their, their personal data. So this idea of being able to um, have data erased if, if something's on there is, is there. Um, you have a month to request, respond to requests. And it's making some money in 2019. Uh, British Airways were fined, they, they lost um, 500,000 uh, names and addresses of customers and they were fined 183.4 million. The Marriott Ho Hotel, um, they were fined 99.2 million. Sadly, the year before when data uh, was shared through Cambridge Analytica, it was pre-GDPR. Facebook were fined 500,000 pounds. If it was today's, um, time, it would have been 1.26 billion pounds, because it's 4%, up to 4% of the revenue of, of the organisation. And there's GDPR Coalition Ireland, that's, that's a useful resource to look at, and um, something called the Five Rights Framework, again resources to have a look at afterwards. So what are the implications for education? The JISC website um, is very informative and uh, I know universities and those responsible for um, the data that we hold for students will be completely on the case um, and it needs to be that we document why information is held, how it's collected, when it will be deleted or anonymised and who, who may gain access to it. And going back to learning analytics, this, I think, is really important that we're transparent with our students that if we are collecting the data and how we're using it is made explicit to, to them so that they don't have unspoken fears that they're talking about with their peers. It's about being transparent. Before I write my name on the board, I'll need to know how you're planning to use that data. Students are going to begin to question as they've not already started questioning. So that's the data. 
So in terms of dialogue, as I say, I can wax lyrical about uh, how social media can empower indivi individuals to um, become communicators, creators, curators, critics, conversationalists and collaborators, and to continue that dialogue face to face. And I talked about that back in 2013 when I did a talk on digital scholarship at um, Reading University. But social is a behavior, not a channel, and, and people like social interaction. Um, and I think it's important that we don't get too worried, although it is a worry, about the data and, and, and um, those, those concerns, that we throw the baby out with the bathwater and, and we don't use, utilize these um, social networking tools to have good experiences with our, our peers. I really like this um, sketch note by Tane Vore, and, and I, I agree that through the sharing, I certainly learn every single day. I get my mobile phone out and traveling into work and I learn something new from someone in my, my network. Um, and it's just so, so powerful and it can be powerful. This is a Node Excel map of FOTI 2011. Was anybody there? Does anybody remember the future of technology and education? So this, um, this, there's a few people you can see, you see on there. This conference is a, was a free conference It's at ULCC, um, and you had to tweet on Twitter to actually get a ticket. And I didn't get there the year before. And I can remember tweeting and saying, I really would like to go to this conference this year. Um, and Frank Steiner, who was one of the uh, organizers, picked it up. But then when he picked it up, he started to look at my online presence and my profile. And because I'd recently done um, a couple of presentations, put those on SlideShare, which then went on to my LinkedIn profile, he then saw some of the things that I've been talking about and invited me to be one of the keynotes. So not only did I get to the conference, I actually got to talk there, which was uh, quite uncanny. And there was an article um, in the LSE Impact blog, which is um, a, a great blog to, to read, about scientists who selfie. So changing the stereotypes of you know, the jobs that we actually do, that those visuals that we can share through um, social media um, can be really, really helpful. Not just for us, but for our students and our family and our children. But it's directing people to the right places and connecting with the right people to make sure that they're seeing the right things. I always say Twitter's only as good as the people that you actually follow. And there's this opportunity to develop communities where you share something in common. We've done that face-to-face -face for, forever. That's, that's no new concept. Um, but what the internet can do and social media can do is, is bring people across um, the globe. And I love this quote from Sherry Spillock. May it never cease to amaze us that overwhelmingly vast majority of humanity plays by the rules and means well. You know, we, we do have to continue to believe in um, people that, you know, we can share good things. Um, otherwise, it's time to, to give up. When I was looking at the uh, idea of belongingness, um, the Stanford University have got a belonging project. Um, which starts off really well. The sense of belonging is deeply important to emotional health and personal well-being. But it ends when it's talking about the students, um, that they, they can develop a sense of belonging when they feel connected to other people, especially those who share their distinct life experiences, interests, or goals. And that I disagree with. And Christina Ramsey has got a really nice quote uh, that she's got pinned on her Twitter account that says, it is our variability that gives us collective strength. You know, students want to meet lots and lots of different people. We want to meet lots of different people, not just the people that share the opinions um, that, that we have. Diversity is having a seat at the table, inclusion is having a voice, and belonging is having that voice be heard. And I quite like this quote, space becomes place when it acquires symbolic meaning and a concrete definition, marking the whole spectrum of identity and sense of belonging. So the spaces to me are the structure, the places that we, we can um, frequent, but it's the places, they only become meaningful if people are invited into those and feel, feel welcome. 
because belonging can also be considered as, as something that's owned. You have to be suitable, you have to be acceptable. The antonym of belonging is being free and independent, self-sufficient, liberated. And a lot of us like to go off peace and be, be like that, and that's not a bad thing. But in terms of belonging and, and, and social media and communities, we need to make sure that people are um, accepted, um, they're wanted, drawn, drawn in. So what, whatever the um, community that you might have, you know, look at the quiet people, draw those people in, just as you would do if you were face to face, the ones that are quiet, the introverts. And of course, even through some of the positives, there are, are still issues. It's really important that we still continue to have the conversations about the digital footprint that we're leaving when we use any online tools. And um, at Edinburgh, there's a really nice resource, the digital footprint. Um, if you've not already seen that, um, do, do visit it that you can use with your own students. And along the way, we're having to learn constantly new literacies. So graphic literacies, you know, how do we read infographics? What does it mean to have a personal learning network? Multitasking, is it the right thing to do? And we need to build ethical literacy and trust and know that we can be trusted in the things that we actually share. And there are things that can be missed easily online, emotions. And some of the ways that people are overcoming this now they're using emoticons, emojis, GIFs. GIFs are really popular on, on Twitter. But what they can actually do is show some of the emotions that we've got, whereas text is flat and doesn't necessarily show those, those things. And there's something about what is said, not said, as well as how it's actually said. I picked up some, on some tweets last, uh, a couple, couple of weeks ago. It was... Um, when the BTEC and A-level results um, were coming out one, one day apart. And there's lots always talked about the A-level results, but what about the BTEC? You know, we must remember, um, and, and this tweet was saying, you know, there's lots of fuss about um, A-levels, but not um, BTEC. And it was the BBC that said, you know, they questioned some of the students when they're interviewing them. Did you not get along with A-levels? Not understanding that, you know, these vocational qualifications are equally as important. I left school and went to college because I didn't like the A-levels that were on offer. I actually wanted to be a domestic science teacher. I love cooking. Um, so I went to college for two years um, and I had a magnificent experience. It did actually give me the qualifications to get into university, although that's another long story, but I didn't go to university. But I didn't start university until 2004. If you want to know more, you can ask me at coffee. And then people responding to that. So, so when there's information missing, it's absolutely fine to jump in and say, you know, what about this point of view? Um, and Laura Burden came in and told her story. Um, the STEMETs celebrated both, which is, which is great. It's a, an organization that brings girls in, in, in STEM together, if you've not heard of that. And of course, there is toxic Twitter. Twitter um, and there's lots that I could say, say about this, and we could spend another three hours, four hours, days, weeks, months talking about um, the things going on. Um, and, and we need to be aware of that. There's disinformation, misinformation, and fake news. We need to help our students um, understand what the difference of those things are. There's constantly information saying about, you know, we're con on, online. Uh, roughly three in 10 US ad adults, apparently through P Pew Research, um, are uh, online all the time. When I looked at the methodology, they'd only actually consulted 1,502 people, but um, there we go. The Economist in 2019 uh, was talking about the social media addiction getting getting worse. And in retaliation to this, Josh Hawley has come up with the Social Media Addiction Reduction Technology Act, the SMART Act. 
it's real. I looked at the, um, the details. There's a PDF, you can have a look at it later. To prohibit it, social media companies from using practices that exploit human psychology or brain psychology. And that all starts well. That sounds, sounds interesting, and I think it needs to be looked at. But what it's actually proposing is that it will stop the infinite scroll, the, the elimination of natural stopping, autoplay, and any badges or rewards linked to social media. So in short, that would be the autoplay from YouTube, infinite scrolling on Twitter and Facebook feeds, um, outlaw um, gamification in Snapchat, uh, and it would bring up conspicuous pop-ups to make sure that that actually happened and you're aware. However, sadly, within the same document, it said that this does not include email. But there is concern about um, the inference scroll and the red alerts, and you know, there's, there's something about the use of red being important. And so when you look at your mobile phone, you'll see the little circle of how many uh, emails you've yet to read, how many notifications on your social media channels um, you've got to read, and, and you know, to some degree, it can make you anxious, and it makes others more anxious. It is, it is a worry. And there are implications of the like buttons and what that means. Um, there's a good te TED talk that Jack Dorsey from Twitter um, has, has given. And, and they're even thinking about, or he's talked about removing the like buttons because it makes people so um, incensed. David Hopkins on his blog has wrote, wrote about what does it mean to like something? If somebody's wrote a post, there's actually an unhappy post, a sad or angry, and we're liking it, what does that actually convey? Is the like and equivalent type buttons um, appropriate still? And there's research going on about managing um, young people, especially well-being um, and mental health. I'll say all, all these resources are in the, uh, the footnotes. Um, Education for Connected World, there's the UK Council for Internet Safety, things going on there. Um, the government has got an online harms paper, there's information in, in there to, to consider. And we need to think about what not to, to share. And there's guidance, uh, again, from the government uh, and a share checklist. You know, think about the source, the headline, analyse it, has it been retouched and changed? Um, you know, and is it false? Are there er errors? It's, it's quite useful um, to use with your own students and have those conversations. Because there's no good just banning social media and technology. That's never going to happen. They're only going to do it when they're outside the room. Um, we need to have these conversations. So a lot to think about there, and I hope that wasn't too rushed. But as I was gathering the, the information, um, I wanted to make sure that I um, captured those so that you can revisit them um, yourselves and read in depth if you want to later. But it would be remiss of me if I didn't talk about the, the, the doing and, and how it, it can be done. Um, social media can be used um, usefully and powerfully. So this is... Um, a work in progress, I'm trying to put together a, an infographic that can fit on one page of how, how it could be used. Um, so student recruitment, promoting research, promoting events, achievements of staff and students I think is really important. Um, social media can be used really effectively for crisis communications. Um, Twitter is the first thing we go to when um, our VLE goes down, it tells us, you know, oh, this is what's happening. Um, business partnerships, graduation, keeping in touch with um, our alumni is, is really helpful. And then there's the people and the team. So um, in terms of our students and staff, we can use it to um, build communities. Uh, we can have interactive activities inside and outside of the classroom and, and so on. But we also need to think about um, the things in the outside circle, the well-being, the spaces, protocols, responsibility, and, and uh, evaluating what we actually do. It's important that we think about the impact of, of what we're doing, what students are doing, uh, for, for good and for, for otherwise. Um, because we need to look at that, and, and if things do go wrong, how can we put them right? How can we help our students put, put things, things right? And now I'm going to share some, some of the things that I've, I've 
Um, there's there's so, so many things I could share, but I've just picked out some um, useful things about how people can gain information from the community. So this, this is a snapshot, hope you don't mind, Lorna, um, <coughs> of starting her Seymour. And she actually went out through, through Twitter to, to get some advice and got seven pages of tweets. So she storified it, which was um, a really, really good idea, and then made it into PDF, because you may know that Storyfy is gone. But there is Wakelet um, as, as a recovery, um, which, which we uh, use now. Uh, David Hopkins, blogging, writing, getting people to write with him, I think is really important about all these, these thorn, thorny issues around technology. Santano, I don't think is here today. Um, for the last couple of years, he's come up with this idea of the HE blog swap. So actually having a buddy and swapping, so sort of doing a, a, a blog post as a guest on each other's blogs is a really lovely idea. And through the conversations of actually doing that, you're extending your, your network, and I think that could be really helpful. There's people like Helen Webster that have created um, mini courses, the 10 days of Twitter, which other people um, can use. It's got Creative Commons licenses. There's crazy friends like Suzanne who use Snapchat, but very effectively. But what's really interesting is when she blogs about it, she talks about what the students have said and shares that with, with people. Um, still sitting on the fence on, on, on Snapchat, but um, it works with her students. And, and if it works with your students, then that's what's important. It's having the conversation with them. Never be afraid to ask your students, I'm gonna try this new thing. Let's see how it goes. Let's, if it doesn't work, we'll scrap it. We can use some, something else, that's fine. And that just shows you how many Snapchat users they are. So it is a popular space for um, young people these days. And then there's um, tools like WeChat, um, which is used um, in, in China and has been used by um, a tutor to give feedback. So a similar thing to the um, Snapchat, having those interactions and, and the students really liked it. And then there's other um, opportunities. There's a Bring Your Own Devices for Learning um, online uh, course. The latest um, team was Sheila, Alex, Neil, and Deb, and, and Suzanne. Uh, asked Suzanne why she was juggling, juggling later. <laughs> but what was interesting was this, that um, we'd started off with the, the five C's, connecting, communicating, curating, collaborating, um, and they, they took that um, forward. And this LTA chats, um, lots of people to look at there, and um, Chris Rowell's book, which a lot of people um, from Alt have contributed to, to this book. Lots of other useful um, resources in there, and I'm afraid I've run out of time. I forgot to look at my watch um, again. But just quickly want to mention um, the SMASH team, which is my, my students who've, um, well, they rebranded what I was calling a social media um, special interest group to social media for academic studies at Hallam, the SMASH, uh, and they've created card activities. And to start with, they started with the tools, but then they came up with the latest set of cards, which they came to themselves as reverse social media, where they looked at what do we actually want to achieve and the tools that can actually do that. And I felt very proud of the students because they, they, this is kind of self-led with me giving them some information but introducing and, and, and bringing your students in as partners to look at um, some of the thorny issues, I think is very, very important, uh, and to work on this together. So I'd highly recommend um, doing that. Um, just quickly speed past this, there's Lorna's word of caution. Um, and I say give it a go, because collectively, everybody in this room, the networks that you've got, the knowledge that you've got, the things that you say, and your online presence can be really, really powerful. We can all help each other learn, and by being open and sharing that, um, you can make a really big impact. And if you think you're too small to have an impact, try going to bed with a mosquito, and I'll end it there. Thank you. very much.
much, Sue, and what a romp through a lot of information there. Um, the slides will, of course, all be available for you, um, but just before we head to coffee, I think if there are questions um, from anyone in the audience, if you could, um, we'll try to spot you. We've got some roving mics who will run. Um, if you could say where you're from um, and introduce yourself to, to the room before asking your question, and remember to make sure that it's um, uh, that you're heard, that you're holding the microphone before you um, speak. Uh, maybe reflecting on how, or giving example, questions for Sue, or giving examples about how social media is used in your institution, or how you're using it um, to create social networks amongst students uh, where you work. So do we have any questions from the audience that we can see? Just give us a wave. A little bit hard to see from the. A little bit hard. To, let's see if we can go over here to, lady in the peach. It's, it's <laughs> Francis. I'm Francis Bell. I'm not from an institution. I escaped a few years ago, <laughs> um, so uh, I'd call myself an itinerant scholar now. But so I want to also thank Sue. I don't know how you achieved that um, broad s sweep in your in your talk. And I really enjoyed it. So, but there's one thing I wanted to ask you about, which is to do with the doing. And as you were talking, I was wondering what faculty in different disciplines, you know, what people in the psychology discipline, in the information systems discipline that you and I are associated with, in computer science, in business schools, which was my last place I worked, what could they be doing with their students to help them think about how they could do things differently in the future? Well, I think in terms of, this, if we look at um, psychology, is, is actually doing some research, getting the students doing that research and sharing. And I think it would be really powerful if our students across a broad spectrum of disciplines could hear from students actually doing that rather than it just being the theory in the book, the theory that's in the, uh, the journal articles, you know, bringing it to, to life. Um, in terms of computer science, I've, I've spoken about this many times when I've done um, training sessions for colleagues in, in um, computing, you know, where, where they've got perhaps a little bit vexed around the um, chosen VLE that we have. I'll not mention which one it is. Um, and it's like, well, why don't you actually reinvent something yourselves? You know, the, the, the technology, the, the, the knowledge, the coding, you know, is not beyond the realms of getting staff and students to work together. Because if we were to reinvent spaces where we can connect, you know, the, the ideal online social space, what would that actually look like? And the only way we could find out is, is to, you know, put that out to students, to experiment. Because there is an element of you don't know what you don't know, and if you've not experienced it, how do you know that this is going to be effective or not effective? You know, so there, there would need to be lots of different trials. But I think, you know, collectively in computer science, we've got the potential. You know, why is it always America that comes up with a solution? Um, and James Clay asked me to speak at um, an event um, a few, few months ago, and I talked about this idea of the ideal device that would give students where it would pull everything in. And I talked about that, actually, um, with some postgraduate students taking um, a couple of courses, data science and um, MSc computing. And one of the students actually contacted me afterwards. He says, you know, that's really got me thinking. Uh, and he's looking when he finishes his master's to do a PhD. And he says, I'd really like to take that forward. You know, so I think there's a potential to do that. There's lots, lots to explore. Thank you. We have another question here. Uh, thank you, uh, Alan Williamson, University of Derby Online. That was a very thought-provoking presentation. Not only the privacy in social media, but what about um, VLEs? Just recently, in the last few weeks, I've noticed I've had to agree to various term conditions, which I confess I haven't read. Uh, but it's not just social media and retail that privacy Absolutely. potentially affects. Absolutely. Any comment particularly about that? That would be interesting. Well, it's the next uh, online course that we're going to be <laughs> having to do, a mandatory one. And you'll get the emails one after another until you've actually completed it. 
Um, but in all seriousness, you know, well, we need to have these conversations and it needs to be brought down to a level that, you know, it's not going to be boring and stuffy and, oh, I can't use my time to, you know, read all of this stuff. Because, you know, if, if you do look at some T's and C's, you know, they, they're gone forever. Um, you know, we need to cut to the chase. What does it actually mean? What do we need personally need to be really concerned about and know about? And it, it's making that information um, digestible, understandable, and absolutely transparently clear. Thank you. Can I have, so in the room, um, can you raise your hand if you are involved in your institution in discussions about student data and privacy? Yeah, okay, so this is a, something that it's, is a lot of us are involved in as part of our work. And are you, in, so, so that question was about um, involved in the institution. How many of you are involved in discussions with vendors and suppliers about data and privacy? Okay, so if you, got, if you can raise your hands right up, because I think that that's an area that we can share um, knowledge amongst the community because we were, if we're all separately in discussions with vendors about what they're doing with our student data, it might make sense to just check the kinds of um, answers that we're getting from the various different suppliers. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, are there any other questions from the, from the floor? I know that we're keeping you from coffee and it's gotten a little bit chilly in here so we all need to you know, run down uh, to coffee and snacks. Okay, I'm going to let you go for your coffee. We're going to have a break for coffee time and then we start the dozens and dozens of parallel sessions. Thank you very much. We can give Sue another thanks. Edina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with Notable, our Jupyter Notebook service. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology.
Edina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with Notable, our Jupyter Notebook service. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology. Edina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with Notable, our Jupyter Notebook service. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology.
Edina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with Notable, our Jupyter Notebook service. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology. Edina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with Notable, our Jupyter Notebook service. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology.